The Autopulse is a revolutionary load distributing band resuscitation device that provides continuous high quality chest compressions resulting in improved blood flow and thus the potential for better outcomes for victims of sudden cardiac arrest. The Food and Drug Administration approved indication for use of the Autopulse is the Autopulse resuscitation system model 100 is intended to be used as an adjunct to manual CPR on adult patients only in cases of clinical death as defined by a lack of spontaneous breathing and pulse. In their respective guidelines 2005 for cardiopulmonary resuscitation and emergency cardiac care, both the American Heart Association and European Resuscitation Council stress the importance of high quality uninterrupted chest compressions as being critically important for survival from sudden cardiac arrest. The AHA document specifically states, simply put, push hard, push fast, allow full chest recoil, minimize interruptions in compressions. Both organizations also point out that low distributing band or LDB chest compressions may be considered for use as an adjunct to CPR both in and outside of hospitals. The AHA writes, LDB CPR may be considered for use by properly trained personnel as an adjunct to CPR for patients with cardiac arrest in the out-of-hospital or in-hospital setting. The Autopulse offers a number of critical benefits for the sudden cardiac arrest patient as well as a clinician who is attempting to resuscitate him or her. A growing body of third-party clinical evidence demonstrates the Autopulse helps to improve blood flow as well as short and long-term survival. It functions as an additional person, freeing up a clinician to perform other critical life-saving tasks. It's fast, easy, and intuitive to start up and use, and it helps keep the clinician safer by eliminating the need to do manual chest compressions in the back of a moving ambulance or on a hospital bed or gurning. Please always keep in mind that the keys to successful autopulse use are early rapid deployment and minimal pausing or no flow time. The major components of the autopulse system are the autopulse platform, commonly called the board, the life band, low distributing band, the battery and battery charger. Key accessories for transporting the autopulse are the carry case for EMS, and transporter IV pull type device for the hospital. First, let's take a closer look at the key features of the Autopulse platform. At the head end of the board is the on-off button. The on-off button is recessed and set away from the user control panel to minimize the risk of inadvertently turning the device off. The user control panel is located here. The user control panel includes the user display which is an LCD screen on which instructions and other information are shown. The light dark contrast for the screen can be adjusted with these contrast buttons. The green power LED is lit whenever the autopulse is powered on and able to respond to user input. The red alert LED makes the user aware of a condition that requires attention. When the red alert LED is lit, further information and instructions are shown on the user display. The current compression mode is shown on the upper left hand corner of the user display. In this case, the autopulse is set for a compression to ventilation ratio of 30 to 2, in keeping with current guidelines. At the bottom of the user control panel are the green go and orange stop buttons, which are integral to the operation of the device. This is the mute button. Once pressed, the mute button disables all audio alert tones except for the low battery warning, ventilation tones, and pause alert tones. Low battery, ventilation, and pause alert tones cannot be turned off, but they can be muted for 30 seconds using the mute button. Pressing the mute button again re-enables all tones. This gray menu button allows the user to review information pertaining to the last patient as well as the platform and battery. This is the battery charge icon. When the battery charge icon has four bars, the battery is fully charged. Three bars means there is two-thirds of the battery life left. Two bars means there is one-third remaining. And one bar means that there is approximately five minutes left of operating time and that the battery should be changed as soon as possible. This yellow line is a guide for patient alignment. 
The bottom of the armpits should be aligned on the yellow line. This black bar, often referred to as the load cell, is a key component of the compression monitoring system. The load cell initially senses a patient on the autopulse platform. During patient sizing, the compression monitoring system automatically calculates the chest size, shape, and resistance, then determines the force necessary to compress the chest the prescribed amount. This ensures the autopulse performs a 20% anterior to posterior sternal compression at a depth of one and a half to two inches, or four to five centimeters, as recommended by AHA and ERC guidelines. During active autopulse operation, this system continuously monitors the compressions and makes adjustments as necessary. The compression monitoring system is also one of the many safety features of the autopulse. When the system senses something is wrong, it stops operation of the device and alerts the user. We'll cover this in more detail in a later section. There are two vents on the back of the autopulse, located here and here. It is important to make sure that the vents do not get blocked with clothing or bedding. Although the autopulse can work in the rain and other wet environments, do not allow the autopulse to be submersed in water. Consider it water resistant, but not waterproof. The autopulse battery is located at the head end of the platform, near the on-off button. The battery technology is nickel metal hydride, chosen because of its ability to reliably supply considerable power. A fully charged battery will last a minimum of 30 minutes of continuous compressions on a nominal patient. When the battery has 5 minutes of operation left, the battery charge icon will display only one bar. Warning tones will sound, the red alert LED will be lit, and the user display will flash a low battery warning on the screen. At this point, you should replace the battery with a freshly charged one. To remove the battery, power off the autopulse by pressing the on-off button. Then, move the battery latch to its open position by rotating it clockwise. Disengage the locking bar at the top of the battery, grasp the battery, and slide it out. Take the used battery and carefully slide it into the charger. Very little force is needed to slide the battery into the charger or into the autopulse. Charging a fully depleted battery takes a maximum of four and a quarter hours. Take a freshly charged battery from the charger and slide it most of the way into the battery bay of the autopulse platform. Then push the battery into place. You will hear a click as the latch engages. When properly installed, the end of the battery should be flush with the autopulse platform. Close the battery latch by rotating it counterclockwise. Now, power on the autopulse by pressing the on-off button. Every time the autopulse is powered on, it runs a complete system check, including multiple self-tests. Once the freshly charged battery is installed, the battery charge icon should display four bars. The battery should be changed when a low battery warning occurs, after each use, at the beginning of each shift, or at a minimum once every 24 hours. The battery should be stored in the charger when not in use. The autopulse battery is smart and provides significant information for the user's benefit. The battery status indicator is a white button at the end of the battery that, when pushed, provides information about the battery status. Green means good. The battery is fully charged. Yellow means the battery has some life. However, it should be placed into the charger to be charged as soon as possible. Red means the battery has failed and should be taken out of service. In this case, place the battery into the charger to confirm the failed status and then contact technical support. Each autopulse battery is factory programmed to deliver 100 charge cycles. A charge cycle is counted by the smart battery when the fully charged battery is depleted by more than one third. You can see how many charge cycles an individual battery has used by viewing the battery info feature accessed by pressing the menu button. To ensure that the battery operates to specifications, 
it is automatically run through a test cycle by the charger every 10 battery charge cycles. During the test cycle, the battery is charged, then discharged, and fully charged again, testing to make sure that the cells are taking the charge properly. The test cycle can take up to 10 hours to complete. Do not remove the battery from the charger during the test cycle. You can also initiate a test cycle at any time by pressing the Start Test button on the charger. The Autopulse's low distributing life band is integral to the device's unique ability to improve blood flow and lessen the possibility of CPR related injuries. The life band takes the force that is normally applied to one small area under the hands during manual CPR or at the end of a piston with pneumatic driven devices and spreads that force over a much wider surface area of the chest. The life band can accommodate the following patient specifications chest circumference between 30 and 51 inches or 76 and 130 centimeters, chest widths between 10 and 15 inches or 25 and 38 centimeters, weights up to a maximum specified 300 pounds or 136 kilograms. However, since weight is distributed differently on various body types, sometimes it is possible to secure the life band and leave enough slack to potentially allow the autopulse to size the patient that it may be worth trying on a larger patient. If, however, the autopulse is unable to size the patient, immediately open the life band and revert to manual CPR. A new, single-use life band should always be installed along with a freshly charged battery in order to ensure the autopulse is ready for immediate deployment. To change the life band, make sure the autopulse is powered off, then Turn the board over. Lift up on the blue plastic band guards found where the life band meets the sides of the autopulse platform. Remove the cover plate by pinching the four tabs and lifting up. Next, pull each of the now exposed straps laterally. Once this is done, you will be able to see the stitching on the band clip that is seated in the drive shaft which in turn is attached to the board's internal motor. Do not change out the life band if the drive shaft is not in this position with the bands completely unwound. Next, push in the white guide plate and lift up on the bottom end of the yellow band clip. Dispose of the life band properly in either a biohazard container or in the garbage. To install a new life band, align the graphics on the cover plate. Insert the top end of the band clip into the drive shaft. Push down on the tail end of the band clip past the guide plate. The band clip should be seated flush in the drive shaft. Lift up on the band guards and lock the cover plate into place. Turn the auto pulse over and power it on. Every time you power on the autopulse, it runs a complete system check. If the life band is installed properly, you will see the startup screen without any user advisory message. However, if the autopulse detects the life band is not installed properly, the red alert LED will be lit and you will see user advisory number 12 on the user display. If this occurs, repeat the installation steps. The life band should only be removed and replaced according to this procedure. The life band should never be cut. If a life band does get cut for some reason, follow these steps. Pull on both ends of the bands, fully extending them. If the ends are not accessible, turn the auto pulse over and remove the cover plate. Be very careful not to manually unwind the bands. Instead, Take both ends of the bands and pull them out. The drive shaft should be returned to the home position with the band clip stitching visible. Turn the auto pulse over and power it on. If no user advisory exists, follow the normal procedure for removing the life band. If there is a user advisory number 45 on the screen, press the green restart button in an attempt to clear the advisory. If the user advisory number 45 does not clear, contact technical service for assistance.
Once cardiac arrest has been identified, it is critically important to reestablish blood flow as quickly as possible and minimize interruptions to chest compressions. This segment will demonstrate the basic steps for deploying the autopulse. Subsequent sections will depict more detailed, advanced methods specific to out of and in hospital settings. To rapidly deploy the autopulse, sit the patient up. Perform a single cut of the clothing down the center of the back. Turn the autopulse on using the recessed on-off switch at the head end of the platform and slide the board into position under the patient. Basic instructions are clearly laid out on the user display. It says, align the patient on the platform, close the life band, and then press continue. Defibrillation pads should be applied according to local protocol. If anterior-posterior is the preferred placement, the back pad should be placed while the patient is sitting up or prior to being rolled onto the board. If apex sternum is standard, both pads should be applied after the patient is placed on the board. Lay the patient back down on the board, ensuring the armpits are just above the yellow guideline. Alternatively, the board may be placed to the patient's side and the patient may be log rolled onto it. Remove the clothing from the patient's upper torso by pulling it down from the sleeves. It's important to remove all of the clothing from the patient's upper torso to avoid interference of the clothing with device operation. In addition, the direct skin-to-board contact helps minimize the possibility of the patient sliding. Alternatively, the shirt may be cut up the front midline and up the right arm and then removed during the log roll. Once the patient is properly placed on the board, Apply the front defibrillation pad if local protocol is anterior-posterior placement, or both pads if apex sternum is the preferred method. Next, close both sides of the life band by placing the side marked with the number one on the patient's chest. Then, use your index and middle fingers to guide the yellow female alignment slot on the bottom side of number two over the yellow male alignment tab on number one and secure the assembly with the Velcro that is attached to each side. If local protocol is shock first, perform a quick check rhythm assessment and shock if necessary. If local protocol is CPR first, initiate operation of the autopulse. Pull the assembled life band up to its fullest extension to set the internal motor to its starting or home position. And while doing so, ensure that the bands are not twisted and they are at a 90 degree angle to the board. Place the life band on the patient's chest, ensuring that the yellow alignment tab is placed over the spot at which you would normally perform manual chest compressions. Once the life band is properly placed, press the green continue button. The autopulse will automatically size the patient's chest, measuring the appropriate size, shape, and resistance of that individual and then determine the force necessary to compress the chest the prescribed amount. No one should be touching the life band during this process. After sizing the patient, the autopulse will give you three seconds to check patient alignment. If the patient needs to be realigned, press the orange stop button, realign the patient, and press the green continue button again. If the patient does not need to be realigned, you have the option of pressing the green continue button to begin compressions immediately. After this three second alignment check interval, if neither the green continue button nor the orange stop button is pressed, the autopulse will automatically begin compressions. In keeping with current AHA and ERC guidelines, the autopulse is pre-programmed to a default 30 to 2 compression to ventilation ratio. It performs 30 compressions, followed by a 3 second pause to deliver 2 ventilations. There are 3 audible tones that sound during the 28th, 29th, and 30th compressions to give the person performing the ventilations adequate notice that it will soon be time to ventilate. For advanced life support, once the patient is intubated, it is very easy to switch on the fly to continuous compression only mode. You simply press the gray switch to continuous button once and then immediately a second time within two seconds to confirm continuous mode. Once continuous mode is activated, you will hear a confirmation tone and the word continuous will replace 30 to 2 in the upper left hand corner of the user display.
During the continuous mode, a ventilation tone will sound asynchronously at a rate of eight per minute. Ventilate as appropriate during relaxation. You can switch back to 30 to two in the same manner. Always minimize any interruptions to compressions with the autopulse. Legitimate reasons for interrupting compressions include rhythm assessment, spontaneous pulse assessment, external pacing, and defibrillation, although many clinicians choose not to pause the autopulse to defibrillate. Compressions should be delivered while charging the defibrillator. The autopulse pause time should not exceed five seconds either pre or post defibrillation shock. While some clinicians choose to intubate while the autopulse is compressing, the recommended method is to do so when the device has paused for ventilation. To minimize unnecessary or unusually lengthy pauses in blood flow, the autopulse is equipped with a timer on the user display. The timer allows the user to see, in real time, exactly how long compressions have been underway and exactly how long the patient has been without perfusion. The timer records the elapsed time from the start of compressions to when they are paused. Once compressions are stopped, the counter is reset to zero and immediately begins tracking no flow time. The timer resets to zero once again and begins tracking compressions once active autopulse operation is resumed. To further assist clinicians in minimizing no flow time, the autopulse has a pause alert tone as a reminder that blood flow for the patient has been stopped. Once the autopulse is paused for 10 seconds, a single tone will sound. After 20 seconds of no flow time, a series of three pause alert tones will sound. After 30 seconds, the tones will sound continuously until either compressions are resumed or the mute button is pressed. The tone mute button mutes the pause alert tones for 30 seconds only. After 30 seconds, the pause alert tones will resume sounding. As the autopulse is operating, you may see things not normally seen during manual CPR. During compressions, you may see some undulating movement of the abdomen. In large patients, this movement may be quite pronounced. Although the autopulse may look forceful when in active operation, it applies only the force necessary to compress the chest the same amount as manual CPR. This force is applied over a much wider surface area by the load distributing life band. You also may see some arm movement during operation. If necessary, hold onto the arm while you are starting an IV. Large or wide patients may develop minor skin irritation from the life band rubbing on the axillary chest during compressions. These are typically superficial. Clinicians may also see head movement when using the autopulse. Pad behind the head using a towel or cloth as needed. Use of the autopulse head immobilizer or similar techniques will help minimize head movement. Additional details regarding patient immobilization will be covered in the extrication section. When you need to move or extricate a patient on the autopulse, do so according to the following guidelines. Apply both the autopulse shoulder restraint and head immobilizer prior to any movement and or extrication. Do not strap across or otherwise constrain movement of the life band. Ensure that chest rise and recoil are not impeded. Try not to carry the patient at an angle greater than 45 degrees. To apply the shoulder restraint, clip in the black straps to the loops near the patient's head. Clip in the yellow straps to the pin next to the yellow line on the platform. Adjust into position as needed and then partially tighten by pulling the yellow ends first. Then partially tighten the black straps near the patient's head. It is critically important to ensure that the shoulder restraint in no way impedes chest wall recoil. If the shoulder restraint is too tight, it could negatively impact proper autopulse operation and potentially reduce blood flow. It is not necessary to stop the autopulse to deploy the shoulder restraint. To apply the head immobilizer, first place it under the patient's head as shown on the diagrams. Fold each side of the support panel with the outer flap folded under. 
press down to secure with Velcro, then tape across the patient's forehead above the eyebrows and secure to the autopulse platform. Standard head blocks and tape may also be used. The recommended method of extrication is use of the soft stretcher. The cradling effect that the stretcher has when it is lifted helps maintain alignment. Place the soft stretcher on the ground next to the patient. Ensure that the shoulder restraint and head immobilizer are in place. Move the autopulse and patient onto the soft stretcher. Rescuers can shorten the overall length of the patient during extrication by allowing the lower legs to bend down at the knees. This can help to negotiate tight corners. When using a standard backboard, the patient needs to be properly secured to the autopulse, preferably with the shoulder restraint and head immobilizer. Once the patient has been secured to the autopulse, secure the autopulse to the backboard with zip ties. The autopulse has multiple built-in safety features. The accuracy of both the hardware and software is constantly being internally monitored as the machine is operating. If an issue is detected, the autopulse can safely stop itself within a fraction of a second in order to prevent any potentially unsafe condition. When this happens, a user advisory message flashes on the user display and the red alert LED lights up. A user advisory or fault message indicates the device has detected some sort of change in normal operation. It does not necessarily mean that there is a problem. It simply indicates that the user needs to check to be sure that there is no unsafe conditions and that it is okay to resume compressions. Once the user advisory or fault has been cleared, the autopulse can be easily restarted. There are several situations that can cause a user advisory or fault. The most common ones occur when the device is unable to detect a patient with the proper physical characteristics for appropriate use. A user advisory will also occur if the patient shifts on the autopulse platform during operation due to movement or extrication, or if the life band is open during device operation. Clearing a user advisory or fault is usually fairly easy. Instructions are clearly laid out on the user display. You simply need to pull the life band all the way up to its fully extended position, ensuring that the bands are not twisted. Then, place the life band back on the patient's chest with the yellow tab on the spot at which manual chest compressions are typically done. Next, check the patient's alignment, ensuring that the armpits are aligned near the yellow guideline. The green button now says restart, and the green LED is lit, indicating that it is now a choice. Press the restart button, and the user advisory should clear. If the advisory does not clear, make sure the life band is in its fully extended position. Be careful that you do not overshoot the drive shaft past its starting or home position. Recheck patient alignment, then press restart again. If the user advisory or fault does not clear the second time, consider the autopulse out of service and immediately open the life band and revert to manual CPR. The autopulse displays a system error message if the device detects an irrecoverable internal error. In this case, the autopulse stops compression and the red alert LED is lit. The user display states, system error, out of service, revert to manual CPR. The autopulse should be considered out of service and the life band should be opened and manual CPR initiated. The life band also has its own safety feature built into it. On one side of the life band, there is a release pin that is set to break at a predetermined force. This component prevents too much force from being applied to a patient's chest. If the patient is too large, the amount of force required to reduce the patient's chest by 20% may exceed the tensile strength of the release pin, causing it to break open. There will be a loud pop when this happens. It may release on the first compression or possibly later during the resuscitation efforts. When this happens, open the life band and immediately begin manual CPR. On initial power-up of the autopulse, pressing the gray menu button allows you to enter the communication mode, view information on the last patient session, the autopulse platform, and the autopulse battery. 
The last three of these items may also be accessed from the administrative menu. Once the menu is active, use the up and down arrow buttons to highlight the desired menu item and the Select Choice button to select it. Information presented about the last patient session includes total compressions, total active time in minutes and seconds, and total pause time also in minutes and seconds. The last patient session data is updated after the autopulse is turned off and on and then one complete compression occurs. Information presented about the autopulse platform is model number, serial number, software version, name of manufacturer, and location of manufacturer, city, state, and country. Information presented about the battery is battery serial number and number of charge cycles performed. From any of the information displays, press the gray menu mode button under the word back to return to the main menu or administrative menu. The autopulse will then return to the idle state ready for patient alignment. The autopulse has an infrared communication port located at the top of the platform near the on-off button. This port can be used to upload history to a PC from approximately the last four patient sessions in a code summary format. This information includes the times when the autopulse was powered on and off, times when it was started and stopped, and the times when compression modes were changed. To perform the upload, power on the PC and open the Zold Data Systems RescueNet code review software. Ensure the autopulse is in the communication mode. If the device is powered off, press the gray menu mode button and power on the autopulse. If powered on, press the gray menu mode button and select communication mode. Once in communication mode, the autopulse will automatically attempt to establish a connection with the host PC. Aim the PC's infrared communication unit at the autopulse's infrared port. When a connection is established, the user display will read connected. If a connection is not able to be established within 10 minutes, the autopulse will automatically power itself off. On the PC, click on the start transmission icon to begin the data upload. Once the upload is complete, the autopulse will return to the connected display. Exit the communication mode by pressing the green restart button. There are several options that may be preset by the administrator or user prior to deployment of the autopulse by using the administrative menu. These options are compression mode, mute duration, and tone volume. The administrative menu also provides information on the last patient session, autopulse platform, and the autopulse battery, all of which is covered in the viewing and uploading data section. To access the administrative menu, the autopulse must be powered off. The administrative menu is activated by pressing the on and off button while simultaneously pressing both the green start and orange stop buttons. Once the administrative menu is active, use the move up and down arrow buttons to highlight the desired menu item and the select choice button to select it. The current setting is displayed in the parentheses after the main menu item. The set mode menu item allows you to restrict autopulse operation to a single compression mode or allow on the fly mode switching. Selecting 30 to 2 or continuous or 15 to 2 or continuous will allow on the fly mode switching between 30 to 2 and continuous compressions or 15 to 2 and continuous compressions respectively while the system is actively doing compressions. Selecting 30 to 2 only or 15 to 2 only will restrict the system operation to the 30 to 2 mode or 15 to 2 mode. Selecting continuous only will restrict system operation to continuous compressions. Highlight the desired setting using the up and down arrow buttons. Press the select choice button to select it. A check will appear beside the selected item and then Press the gray menu mode button under the word back to return to the main administrative menu. The set mute duration menu allows you to set the length of time that the audio tone mute will be sustained when it is activated by pressing the tone mute button or to disable the button's function altogether. The time option allows us to set the mute to last for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, or 120 seconds. 
highlight the desired setting using the up and down arrow buttons. Press the Select Choice button to select it. A check will appear beside the selected item. And then, press the gray menu mode button under the word back to return to the main administrative menu. The set tone volume menu allows you to select the volume of the ventilation and pause alert tones. The choices are high and low. Highlight the desired setting using the up and down buttons and press the select choice button to select it. A check will appear beside the selected item and then Press the gray menu mode button under the word back to return to the main administrative menu. To exit from the administrative menu, press the green start button under the word restart. The auto pull system will restart in the idle state, ready for patient alignment or for system power down. To clean the auto pulse, first remove and dispose of the life band. Then, wipe all the surfaces of the Autopulse platform free of foreign matter and spills with a bacterial wipe. You can use standard cleaning solutions that you would normally use on other electronic equipment, such as a defibrillator. Do not use corrosive cleaners. Check the vents to ensure that they are free and clear of any obstructive matter. Do not submerge the Autopulse platform in liquid. Ensure that the platform is completely dry and install a new life band as instructed before storing. To protect the Autopulse platform from contamination due to excessive bodily fluids, an accessory known as the hygiene barrier is available. To prepare the Autopulse for its next use with the hygiene barrier, position the platform with the rounded end facing up. Slip the hygiene barrier over the platform with the flap opening positioned on the bottom side of the platform. Lay the autopulse flat. Lift the hygiene barrier flap and install a new life band as instructed. Remove the peel off liner from the hygiene barrier flap. Position it over the life band and press to seal the flap. In order to deploy the autopulse quickly and with the least interruption and compressions, a pit crew model, similar to that which is used in auto racing, is suggested for responsibilities and positions of the rescuers involved in using the autopulse and a defibrillator. Since the introduction of the autopulse, it has become clear that those organizations that have been most successful in using it have a very detailed deployment plans to which they consistently train, follow, and monitor. The pit crew method represents an efficient method of utilizing all available resources. In addition, it helps to minimize pauses, keeping no flow time to a minimum. Each EMS organization should determine how this model can be integrated into the typical roles performed by members of its resuscitation team. Practice as a team using this model will help to streamline actions and ensure rapid and efficient deployment. The following is a two-person EMS-specific pit crew type of deployment based on the protocol demonstrated earlier in the basic deployment section. In order to minimize no flow time, manual chest compressions should always be done in the absence of the autopulse and or while the device is being prepared for operation. In the pit crew scenario, rescuer number one runs the code, manages the defibrillator, brings it in, turns it on, applies the defibrillation pads and operates it provides ventilation, sits the patient up, cuts the clothing, and places the patient on the board. Rescuer number two manages the autopulse, brings it in, removes it from the carrying case, turns it on, slides it under the patient, and operates it. Sits the patient up, removes the clothing, and places the patient on the board. As for positions relative to the patient, rescuer number one is to the right of the supine patient along with the defibrillator to his or her right. The autopulse is at the patient's head, and number two is to the left of both the patient and the autopulse. Let's first take a look at the process step by step. Rescuer number two prepares the autopulse for use. He or she brings the autopulse, takes it out of the carry case. The sides of the life band should not be velcroed together while stored. Places it at the head of the patient with the life band open and out to the sides so that the platform is ready to quickly slide into place under the patient. And then 
presses the on-off button at the top of the platform to power it up. Rescuer number one prepares the defibrillator for use. He or she brings it in, places it to the right of the patient and to the right of him or herself, and turns it on. Number one assesses the patient and delivers two bag valve mask breaths. Number one and number two sit the patient up, and number one performs a coroner's cut down the back of the clothing. Number two slides the autopulse under the patient. Number one and number two lay the patient on the board and remove the cut clothing. They position the patient so that he or she is centered laterally from left to right and the patient's armpits are aligned on the yellow guideline on the platform. Number one operates the defibrillator. He or she applies the defibrillator pads to the patient while number two conducts manual chest compressions. Number one then orients the defibrillator cable towards the patient's feet so that it will not interfere with the application of the life band. The life band is then closed around the patient's chest. Rescuer number one places band number one on top of the patient's chest. Rescuer number two guides the mating slot of band number two over the yellow tab of band number one. Rescuer number two presses both sides of the bands together to engage and secure the Velcro fastener. Rescuer number two lifts the secured life band assembly all the way up, ensuring the bands are at a 90 degree angle to the platform, that they are not twisted, and that there are no obstructions. Number two then places the life band on the patient's chest, ensuring that the yellow alignment tab is placed over the position on the sternum where a rescuer's hands would be placed for manual CPR. If the local protocol is shock first, then a quick rhythm check is performed and a shock is delivered if indicated. If the local protocol is CPR first, number two presses the green continue button. The autopool sizes the patient's chest and determines the appropriate force necessary to compress the chest the prescribed amount. All rescuers are careful not to touch the life band while the autopulse is analyzing. Upon the visual cue on the screen, number two verifies that the patient and life band are properly aligned. To begin compressions immediately, rescuer number two then presses the green start button again. Now let's look at the process in its entirety. You okay, you all right? In order to deploy the autopulse quickly, and with the least interruption and compressions, a pit crew model, similar to that which is used in auto racing, is suggested for the responsibilities and positions of the staff members involved in using the autopulse and a defibrillator. Since the introduction of the autopulse, it has become clear that those organizations that have been most successful in using it have a very detailed deployment plans to which they consistently train, follow, and monitor. The pit crew method represents an efficient method of utilizing all available resources. In addition, it helps to minimize pauses, keeping no flow time to a minimum. Each institution should determine how this model can be integrated into the typical roles performed by members of the resuscitation team. Practice as a team using this model will help streamline actions and ensure rapid and efficient deployment. The following is a hospital-specific pit crew type of deployment based on the protocol demonstrated earlier in the basic deployment section. In order to minimize no flow time, manual chest compressions should always be done in the absence of the autopulse and or while the device is being prepared for operation. In the pit crew scenario, staff member number one manages the defibrillator. He or she brings it into the room and places it at the side of the patient, turns it on, applies the defibrillation pads, and operates the defibrillator. He or she also sits the patient up, helps remove the gown, 
places the patient on the board, and helps place the life band on the patient's chest. Staff member number two manages the autopulse. He or she brings the autopulse into the room, removes it from the transporter, turns it on, assures its readiness for operation, positions it at the head or side of the patient, slides it under the patient, and then operates it. Staff member number three simply helps sit the patient up and places him or her on the autopulse and helps remove the gown. As for positions relative to the patient, number one stands to the right of the supine patient along with the defibrillator to his or her right. Number two stands to the left of the patient along with the autopulse, which is to his or her right. Number three is also to the left of the patient and to the left of number two. Let's take a look at the process step by step. Staff member number two prepares the autopulse for use. He or she brings the autopulse in and places it on the left side of the patient and to the right of him or herself. Removes the autopulse from the transporter and lays it flat. Presses the on off button at the top of the platform to power up the autopulse. And places the platform at the head or left side of the patient with the life band open and out to the sides so that the platform is ready to quickly slide under the patient. Staff member number one prepares the defibrillator for use. He or she places the defibrillator to the right of the patient and to the right of him or herself. Turns the defibrillator on. Sits the patient up or log rolls to the side in conjunction with number three and removes the patient gown from the back. And applies the posterior defibrillator pad if anterior posterior placement. While the patient is still in the sitting position, Number two slides the autopulse into position underneath the patient. Number one and number three then lay the patient back onto the platform and remove the gown from the front. They position the patient so that he or she is centered laterally from left to right and his or her armpits are aligned on the yellow guideline. Number three then resumes manual compressions. Number one operates the defibrillator. He or she places the anterior defibrillator pad on the patient's chest or both apex and sternum pads if anterior-anterior placement. Orients the defibrillator cable to the foot of the bed so that it will not interfere with the application of the life band. The life band is then closed around the patient's chest. Staff member number one places band number one on top of the patient's chest. Staff member number two guides the mating slot of band number two over the yellow tab of band number one. Staff member number two presses both sides of the bands together to engage and secure the Velcro fastener. Staff member number two lifts the secured life band assembly all the way up, ensuring that the bands are at a 90 degree angle to the platform, that they are not twisted, and that there are no obstructions. And staff member number two then places the life band on the patient's chest, ensuring that the yellow alignment tab is placed over the position on the sternum where clinicians' hands would be placed for manual CPR. If the hospital's protocol is to shock first, then a quick rhythm check is performed and a shock is delivered if indicated. If the protocol is CPR first, number two presses the green continue button. The autopulse sizes the patient's chest and determines the force necessary to compress the chest the prescribed amount. All staff members are careful not to touch the life band while the autopulse is analyzing. Upon the visual cue on the screen, number two verifies the patient is properly aligned. To begin compressions immediately, staff member number two then presses the green start button again. Now let's look at this process in its entirety. Check pad. Once again, please remember that the keys to successful autopulse use are early, rapid deployment, and minimal pausing or no flow time. The autopulse can't work miracles. 
However, when used as instructed in this video, it will help you to improve blood flow in your cardiac arrest patients, thus giving them a better chance of returning to normal, productive lives.